Okay, so if you're just jumping in here, the previous two videos, you should see a link to one or both of them coming up here soon in the top right hand corner of your screen. Let's use our imagination time here. We're looking at Moses. We're looking at Aaron. That's what the previous two videos were doing here in Ki Tisa, and we're judging Moses's and Aaron's actions. That makes us more or less the prosecuting attorney. When I say us, I mean the Christian uh, church as a whole, messianic people as a whole, everyone who considers themselves of God, Israel. We're looking at our patriarchs and our matriarchs, in this case just patriarchs' behaviors, and we are judging them. And I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to separate myself from us. And instead of being the prosecuting attorney, I'm going to be the defending attorney. And I'm hoping to bring some of you guys with me. So here we are in this great courtroom. We're looking at these circumstances. And we're judging with righteous judgment. It says, judge ye not. Most people stop mid-sentence. But there's more to that. Judge ye not. Except that ye judge with righteous judgment. So what is righteous judgment? A lot of this whole uh, Kitisa series is pretty much the overarching theme of it is righteous judgment, judging the actions of our patriarchs properly. So in the previous two videos, we learned how to look at Moses and Aaron in a new light. Um, in a future video, we're going to look at judgment and mercy themselves in a new light. But before we can do that, we need to straighten out our thought processes about the people. So that's what this video focuses on, the people. We had Moses, we had Aaron, now we're going to look at the people. In order to look at the people properly, we're going to call to the stand evidence found in Samuel chapter 5, 1 Samuel chapter 5. Here's the overall story. The Israelites are at war with the Philistines. The Israelites decide that in order to win at war, they need God with them. So they take the Ark of the Covenant with them. What's in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ark of the Covenant has the tablets, the manna, and the, and the staff that budded, those three things. And Yah's promised, hey, if you build this, I will reside around here. Why? Why did he instruct them to build that, that protected thing that protects his law, uh, the bread of life, manna, which is Yeshua, and the miraculously budding staff? It's because those things are his character, and they all work together. The law and the manna feed the, uh, the dead trees that are us, that have no business budding here in this world, yet because he is miraculous, we grow thanks to him. They take that with them and say, this needs to come with us, this is God's presence, and they lose. The Israelites were fighting war. Yah was fighting war. Yah was fighting a much different war than the Israelites were fighting. So the Philistines take the ark, they have the ark, and then Yah strikes them with plagues several times for over seven months. And then eventually they said, this might be something we need to get rid of. The leaders say, this might not be the God of Israel. Let's make sure. So they say, let's put together a, a horse-drawn carriage, a cow-drawn carriage. Let's put the Ark of the Covenant on the cow-drawn carriage. And then let's not put regular cows on there. We're not putting male cows on there. We're putting female cows. Not only are we going to put female cows there, but we're going to put female cows that have never been yoked. They're not Female cows aren't to be yoked to begin with, but not only are they not supposed to be yoked, but they haven't been yoked, they haven't been trained, they have no idea how to uh, pull a horse-drawn carriage. And both of them have to have just had baby cows. They're not going to want to leave their babies. That's just completely unnatural. So they put all that together, and guess what happens? Those cows walk straight to Kiriath Jerim in Israel, lowing all the way. The ark shows up. The people say, great, God is back. Somebody 
handles God's property improperly, looking into the ark when they have no business looking into the ark. And God kills 50,000. Then another guy, uh, well, that Kiriath Jerem, they say, okay, we need to figure out what to do with this. So they send to their leaders. Sorry about that. Uh, they send to their leaders and they say, do something with this ark. So they take a guy and they basically sacrifice him to, the, to attending to the needs of the ark. And he attends to the needs of the ark and then everything's cool. Samuel 5, verse 1, verse 6, verse 8, and chapter 6, verse 1. This is an overview of those things. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to Ebenezer and Ashdod, obviously, after the battle. But the hand of Yah was heavy on the people of Ashdod, and he ravaged them and struck them with tumors. So they carried the ark of the God of Israel away to Gath, and then again to Ekron, and then eventually after seven months to Israel. So what does this piece of evidence have to do with our looking at the people? What did the Philistines do with the ark? They took it, they said, this is great, and then they started getting plagued. They know that it's because of the God of Israel. You see, God will be who he will be. God's not going to change. He has introduced himself to us as an unchanging God. The Philistines represent the world. What's in their heart? Their heart's unchanging, too. They don't want to make adjustments for God. So they say, this is a problem. Let's get rid of the ark. They send it to another town. Same thing happens. Let's get, the, get rid of the ark. Eventually, they say, we can't keep this ark anywhere. Let's give it back to Israel. Let's get rid of this ark. Then the Israelites receive the ark, and the exact same thing happens. Judgment is brought upon the people of Israel, just like judgment was being brought upon the Philistines. How do the people of Israel react? They don't say, oh, geez, we're getting judged. Let's get rid of God. No. That's the difference between a Philistine heart and an Israelite heart. The Israelites say, what do I have to change in myself so that God can stay? You see, the church oftentimes, they're not saying, hey, let's get rid of God the way that the Philistines did. Nowadays, Satan is way more deceitful than that. He's got all the churches convinced that they can make adjustments to God's character to better fit their needs and political correctness within the church in order uh, for them to keep God. God doesn't change. It's us that has to change. Them trying to change his character is impossible. You can't change God's character. That's the same thing as pushing God away. So here we have the Philistine heart saying, let's get rid of God. And we have the Israelite heart saying, what do I have to change to keep God? Now let's look at the people in Ki Tisa. The plague was a plague of mourning. He plagued the people for what they did, right? What was it that they did? The golden calf. They were adulterous. They whored around with other gods. It was a great sin. So great that God said, I can't do this anymore. I can't be with you. I'm not going to go up with you. At that point, a Philistine heart would have paraded around their victory. They got rid of God. That's not how the Israelites react. The Israelites mourned. They laid down in their tents and surrounded the tabernacle of meeting in hopes that maybe God would return. And the only time they rose up was when the cloud came down to speak with Moses. And they rose up and they worshipped. It was the little glimmer of hope in their hopeless circumstance. They have been brought out of Egypt. They're in the wilderness. They're lost. They're scared. They've got nowhere to go. They've just lost their husband. They don't even consider going to some other nation. They lay down in their tents and mourn surrounding the tabernacle of meeting, which has been brought outside the camp.
that's something that God can work with. God cannot work with a Philistine heart. His character is love, and he just, he just can't do it. So you see, the Lord's character is unchanging. The Philistines were struck not because of their lineage, but because they stood guilty. Thusly, the Israelites too, when they received the ark, stood guilty as well. And we see that the difference is that the Philistines' reaction was, let's get rid of God. And the Israelites' reaction was, what do we have to change in order to keep God around? Just like in the wilderness, the people lamented and made the necessary changes to keep God around. So God is Torah. That's his character. It is his way of operating. It's how he judges circumstances. And Yeshua, he displayed the Father perfectly by being the perfect image of Yah. He was not coming to earth to live his life improperly in order to humor a God who's incapable of ruling his people properly. He came in obedience and agreeance with God. The Israelites, they don't see God as a problem. He and Kisa, the plague of mourning, wouldn't have even happened if the people didn't love God. Remember from our previous video? The plague of mourning began when Yah said he would not be with them anymore. So now we have taken uh, Moses' heart, taken a look into that, Aaron's heart, and taken a look into that, and now we've taken a look into the heart of the people. In the next video, we're going to describe the overarching theme of what's happen happening for all of them, all at the same time. We're going to be taking Yeshua's mission statement, what he does for us individually, and applying it to what he's doing for the people in the wilderness. Hope to see you there. Thank you for watching, and I appreciate you.